All right, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at the oceans, which is chapter 16 in your textbook. This presentation will help you understand ocean geology, marine ecosystems, human impacts on marine environments, and the state of ocean fisheries. Let's start with ocean geology. You know, the world really is one ocean, and we call different regions by different names. Arctic Ocean up here, Pacific Ocean, the largest uh, ocean, etc. And this word oceanography means the study of the physics, chemistry, geology, and biology of the oceans. Oceans cover 71% of Earth's surface, so roughly three-fourths. And oceans contain 97.2% of the planet's surface water, a number that you should be familiar with for apes. Ocean water composition. The ocean consists mostly by mass of the following. 96.5% water, 3% sodium and chloride ions, meaning table salt, and we can write that with these symbols Na plus and Cl minus, Na is sodium, and the other 0.5% are other salts, magnesium, calcium, potassium, bicarbonate, things like that. Um, okay, as far as the vertical structure of it, as we go deeper into the ocean, uh, meaning from the surface going down below, temperature drops. And water temperatures drop steeply in the first 1,000 meters of ocean water. So if you take a look here, and we have meters um, on the left and feet on the right. And this is temperature on the horizontal axis from basically freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, up to tropical, which would be like in the upper 70s. And Santa Barbara here somewhere in the 60s or so. So we can see in tropical areas, it's very warm at the surface. Temperate areas, it's less warm in the area in the surface, like where we live. Polar regions are extremely cold, if you uh, ever saw the movie um, Titanic, then you can just imagine what it would be like to um, be plunged into that arctic water. And uh, But you'll notice that once we go down by about a thousand meters, everything is pretty much the same temperature. Let's take a look at currents, surface currents of the world's oceans. Surface currents, uh, is this is the movement of water along the surface. And you'll notice some patterns here. You know, the equator is right along here, um, going through the um, going through northern south north South America. And uh, when we're in the northern hemisphere, all the currents go clockwise. You can see it here. You see it in the Atlantic Ocean as well. When we're in the southern hemisphere, all these ocean currents go counterclockwise. And we see it consistently. And uh, this is due, or this is related to the Coriolis effect, which we'll study again when we study atmospheric currents. But that's all you really need to know. Um, basically, what causes these ocean currents is wind. And along the equator, the wind always blows from east to west. So that's why we see all these arrow, arrows along the equator going in that direction. And that sets up a current going in these specified directions. Okay. Uh, and these currents are important, you know, in California here, the water is pretty cold because we're getting water that's coming down from a northern area. Whereas if you go swimming on the east coast, if you live in Florida ever or other places along the eastern seaboard, the water is nice and warm because it's coming up from the, um, from the equatorial region. Um, by ocean currents, just to give it a definition, it's a vast river-like flow of water on the surface of the ocean. And they're driven by density differences, uh, sunlight, as it warms different parts of the water, the water will flow, but mostly by wind. And these ocean currents can be warm or cool. They vary in size and speed, and they influence climate. When we experience El Nino every seven years or so, that is due to a shift in ocean currents. Warmer currents are at the surface. And um, we can see here in red is warmer. These are areas of upwelling where water that is deeper has been brought up to the surface, bringing with it lots of nutrients. And then we also see what we call downwelling over here sinking. And this is important too because it's bringing oxygenated water down below. It should make sense that warmer currents are at the surface because when water warms up, it expands a little bit so it becomes less dense and therefore it will. Um, it will rise above the colder temperatures. 
So here's a graphic for upwelling, and this is definitely a concept that you'll need to be familiar with, and we've discussed it a bit before. We saw it in the video, uh, Blue Planet video. But basically we have wind blowing from the north along a coastline. And um, this wind blowing, um, here's drawn blowing lateral to the coast, but it could be blowing off the coast. Basically it's pushing surface water away from the land. And, um, and what happens with that is you get this uh, current set up within here. So the water is being pushed out, but that, um, that water being pushed out from this region here is bringing new water up to replace it. And that new water is nutrient rich. And uh, the fish and the algae, uh, well, the algae are especially happy for that. And then the fish are happy that the algae are happy because that's what they're eating. And this is a really important part of the nutrient cycle for especially phosphorus which is um, dissolved into the water down here from phosphorus-rich rock. And that phosphorus is then brought to the surface. Because otherwise, phosphorus is not very available in other ways. Not like, um, not like nitrogen, which is in the air all around us. So just to summarize some things there, ocean water can move up or down due to wind, heating, or density differences. Upwelling is cold deep water coming to the surface, and it occurs where, well, it can occur where currents diverge. In other words, um, currents separate, some goes up, some goes down. But importantly, it brings nutrients to the surface, and this promotes fisheries. You can also get downwelling, where warm surface water moves downward, and this occurs where ocean currents converge. In other words, where two um, currents kind of run into each other, one often gets pushed downward. And this can bring dissolved oxygen to deep water life. Let's take a look at topography. The seafloor is rugged and complex. The world's deepest canyons, highest mountains, and longest mountain chains are under the ocean. We think of the tallest mountain as being Mount, um, Mount Everest in India. But the actual tallest mountain, if you measure from the seafloor, is Hawaii. And here we see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is an area where two tectonic plates are pulling apart from each other. So we have a diverging plate boundary. And, um, and so this ridge is getting filled in with new rock that's coming in in the form of magma as it's seeping out from where the plates are separating. And then that rock solidifies. And this is a good view actually also of what we call the continental shelf along here, which is the area off the coast that's pretty shallow. And as you go further away from land, then you get into the deeper parts of the, um, uh, of the ocean. And we can see this continental shelf all along here. And it's important because these waters are more shallow. They're also more nutrient rich because they're closer to, to land and part of that nutrient cycle. And so they, um, there's just more, um, more, a lot more productivity. Whereas out in the middle of the ocean, there isn't really much going on. So let's take a look at this aspect of it. A uh, little cutaway slice, continental shelf right along here. Where it drops, we call that the shelf slope break. You don't need to know that. Um, continental slope, again, not a term that's real important. Continental rise um, can be where it's rising a little bit up to an oceanic ridge. Um, the main thing that you need to know here is continental shelf. And this is the area that's close to shore where depths are shallow and a lot of biological activity occurs. You have, um, it's kind of like a, a biome area, if you will, where um, a land biome I mean an ecotone area where a land biome can, um, can overlap a, um, a tidal biome. And of course you see here sediment, and this sediment is um, part of what's putting nutrients into the water here. And um, here you do see a trench formed from one tectonic plate going underneath another. And we learned about that a while back. And uh, that, in these areas here you often have magma that can come up to the, close to the surface and pop up. And then you have volcanic islands. Let's take a look at some of those marine ecosystems as I was um, getting into. So first of all, in the open ocean, these are surface waters where they're, um, they're very variable in their biology. Many areas are scarce in life, but areas like nutrient-rich upwellings teem with life. Plankton shown below are the base of the oceanic food chain. They are the, um, head of the autotrophs capturing the sunlight for which that energy can then go into the food chain. Okay, let's take a look at deep ocean. Deep waters are devoid of sunlight, so ecosystems cannot rely on plant growth. Animals here, which are far and few between, scavenge detritus, or dead organisms from above, or prey on each other, or have symbiotic microbes that produce food for them. 
Here we see the anglerfish. It's one of many bizarre looking deep sea creatures. The luminescent projection on its forehead attracts curious fish, which it eats. Kelp forest. Kelp is large brown algae or seaweed, and it grows up to 60 meters or 200 feet tall from the continental shelves. It creates forests that harbor and feed many other organisms. And we've, we've talked about this quite a bit. Good habitat for sea otters and sea urchins and other life, crabs, whatnot. Coral reefs are another type of marine ecosystem. And um, we see that, well, let's define it. Corals, first of all, I mean, it's a type of tiny invertebrate animal that occur in huge numbers together. And um, as they die, their skeletons build coral reefs out of calcium carbonate. So coral is a living structure, and the little parts of it are called polyps. Uh, maybe you've seen them in a museum. They're, they can be very colorful due to a symbiotic relationship with algae. Uh, when they die, however, they leave behind their minerals, and that slowly builds up a, um, a, a rock, a coral rock, that you may have seen in some people's fish tanks and things like that. Here we see, um, yeah, reefs provide habitat and food for many other animals and are a key ecosystem for biodiversity. Now, that's a really big thing, habitat. They offer protection to animals. If you ever saw Finding Nemo, which I'm sure you have, you know what I'm speaking of. And, um, oh yes, they also help protect coasts by absorbing wave energy. A lot of these coasts, a lot of these reefs, like the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia, can be really important for breaking up the energy of, of um, ocean storms. So that by the time those storms get to the land, the energy of the waves and whatnot has already been decreased by, um, by the reefs. Here we see partial, partially bleached coral. Bleaching occurs when the algae components die. And so that's a really bad sign because, for one thing, algae, many algae are pretty hardy. But um, if they're dying, then what's the reason? And we know that temperatures in our oceans are increasing. And at the same time, the oceans are becoming more acidic from an increased level of carbon dioxide. And so both of these are affecting our coral reefs. Let's take a look at intertidal zones. These occur along rocky beaches. Tides cover organisms most of each day and leave them exposed to air or bathe in tide pools part of the day. So we have huge, very high biodiversity here. We get starfish, crabs, sea urchins, uh, sea anemones, algae, all sorts of things. But they must endure in extreme fluctuating conditions because they can be covered up by water half the day and then exposed for half the day. How do they deal with that? They, um, they're very adapted. In fact, intertidal organisms adapt to certain levels according to how much wave action and coverage by water they prefer, leading to high biodiversity. Even within, even within this intertidal zone, you have many subzones, and you don't need to know all these different subzones, but just realize that some of the lower zones are going to be covered up by water more often, but um, yeah, and some of the higher ones are going to be covered up by water less often, and they're going to be more prone to splash and things like this. So you have to have some kind of organisms that have good adhesion to the rock so they don't wash away. Things like some mussels that you see along here. So these are really important areas to protect for their biodiversity. Because, you know, with this, some of these offer food for um, fish as well. I mean, yeah, fish, bird populations, and whatnot. Salt marshes are another kind of marine ecosystem. They cover intertidal areas with sandy or silty substrate in temperate regions. So temperate, we see these kind of salt marshes. Well, you see them in areas of California. Up in Northern California, there's some marsh areas. Uh, I remember seeing them in Georgia. You see them off the coast of Florida. And there you can especially smell some methane gas given off by um, anaerobic bacteria. And tides flow into and out of channels called tidal creeks. So there, this might be more full when it's high tide and less full when it's low tide. These are flanked with mostly grasses along here. And so um, this is an example of of a wetland. And it's a kind of unique area because you have salt water beginning to mix with um, salt water. And uh, this leads us to estuaries. Well, what I said about mixing with, with um, fresh water, not necessarily. Um, it could just be going into land channels. However, in an estuary, you do have areas where rivers flow into the ocean and mix fresh with salt water. Many salt marshes and mangrove forests occur here. And um, these are biologically very productive. There's lots of fish, birds, and invertebrates. There can be little um, crustaceans that are in the water, little types of shrimps and things like that. 
Here is the Arroyo Borough Estuary at Hendry's Beach. So the water coming in here, this is flowing from um, the Arroyo Borough Creek, which flows through the Wilcox property. So let's take a look at mangrove forest. These are in tropical and subtropical regions, which are sandy and silty beaches that host forests of mangroves. Bushy trees that are adapted to salt water. Pretty amazing thing, really. These trees with their roots, they're very anchored into the um, into the um, uh, soil or what, what not, to the sand underneath. But um, they're so tall that they actually reach up. They are important for habitat. Many animals find homes among the root networks. And these forests are often lost to human development, unfortunately. And uh, it's unfortunate because they provide an important environmental service of coastal protection from tropical storms, as we talked about in class. Wind coming along, it gets broken up by these tall trees. So they're kind of like shelter belts, if you will, or shelter groves. Let's shift gears here and take a look at ocean pollution. You'll be shocked by this next picture. Um, actually, I'm going to stop here and we'll continue in part two.